All right, obviously, Romans chapter 10 is a very famous portion of Scripture. We know we use this a lot when I go out soul winning. Um, and, uh, you know, what my sermon's about this morning, basically, if you're new to this church, if you, you, know, if, if you haven't been here very much before, you might find out that there's some doctrines that maybe we believe that are different than, than you've been taught or that you believe. And, you know, that's fine. And if that's the case, you know, on, on any particular issue, I would hope that you'd be able to just, just hear out the matter and hear, you know, whatever scriptural evidence that we have for believing the things that we believe before just immediately having a reaction to something. But, um, you know, regardless of all of that, the sermon that I'm preaching this morning, I want you to know really what we are all about and honestly what I believe every church should be all about. The main focus and theme of this church is to go out and save the lost. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This, this trumps all other doctrines. Now look, I don't want to downplay the Bible and doctrines of the Bible because they are all important. Every single one of them is important. God's word is truth and we ought to be following as closely as possible and our doctrine should be solid and good. But let's face it. We have differences of opinion on different things. It, it just, just across churches, believers, you know, everyone's going to have to one degree or another, their own understanding of the Bible. Now, it doesn't make them all correct, but I'm not claiming to be perfect. Now, I don't think any church is perfect. I don't think any person is perfect. We're all going to have some flaws or maybe some misunderstandings. But this is the most important thing. And honestly, you know, people have asked me before when I've gone out knocking on doors in the neighborhood, they say, well, Prescott Valley has so many churches. And it does. Prescott Valley, I mean, you just go on Long Look right here. And there's at least like four churches. I mean, there's three churches just right next to each other. And then there's another like a Lutheran church and a Mormon church. And there's churches all over this town. So people are saying, well, why, why are you starting a church in Prescott Valley? Why? why? Why did you pick this town? I mean, people have lots and lots and lots and lots of choices to go to to church. And I'm going to explain why we're here. And it's very simple. And Romans chapter 10 is explaining it because to my knowledge, and I don't know 100% for sure, but from what I've, my experience and from what I've heard, I've been here for about a year and a half now. To the best of my knowledge, nobody else is going out with the gospel, with the true gospel of Jesus Christ, and actually bringing this to the lost on a regular basis. There may be people who are going out and passing out flyers. There may be people who are passing out gospel tracts. There may be, and we know that the Jehovah's Witnesses, we know that the Mormons are out doing stuff. But as far, to the best of my knowledge, nobody is actually going out with the gospel of Jesus Christ and explaining to people how you could know 100% for sure that you are saved. How that you could know that you're going to heaven when you die. And that is why we are here. And this is the focal point. This is the most important thing in every Christian's life. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 because look at verse number 9. We, I have these verses even highlighted in my Bible. Not because I don't know where they are, but it's easy to show people when I'm going out sowing and say, Hey, look, there's a highlighted verse here. And I'll show them what's in the Bible. Look at verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Being saved is very, very easy. It's a simple thing. It's a matter of just putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a very, very simple, good message that we have. I mean, God, what a great God that has given us salvation so freely and so easily that he doesn't require us to go to church. He doesn't require us to do all these different works and, and, and just, just put in all this effort just in order to barely squeak by and make it into heaven. He loves us so much. You know, as John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All we have to do is for our faith in Him. But look, we know that message here. You know, we're a church full of believers. We already believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we all believe. But the world doesn't. Mm -hmm. Most of the world doesn't even know that message. To even have the opportunity to receive it and to believe on it. And again, anyone who goes out and talks to people knows that this is the truth. The vast majority of people you run into... I, I've, I mean, time and time again, I'll go through the plan of salvation. I'll go through the gospel with people. 
And they'll be like, man, no one's ever explained it to me like that. No one has ever showed me that. I never knew truly that. And, and the same, the very same people that might even tell you that they believe salvation's by grace, when you really break it down and go through it, ultimately the vast majority of people are still trusting in their works. Mm -hmm. right. They're still trusting and being a good person. They might tell you, well, yeah, salvation's by grace through faith because they've heard it over and over again in church. And it's one thing to hear something and repeat it and to just on the surface say, well, that sounds good. It's another thing to understand it. Now, it's my firm belief that if you don't fully understand the gospel, you can't be saved because what are you believing? Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's a difficult message. It's not that it's complicated because it's very simple. But the bottom line is most people just, they still just don't quite get it. Which is one of the reasons why when we go soul winning, I'll try giving examples. I like to give examples of like being born again. You know, when you're born into someone's family, when you're a child of that family, no matter what you do, you're always a child. I mean, there's rules laid out for you as a child. Your mom and dad give you rules that you have to obey and follow. Just like God gives us rules that we need to obey and we need to follow. But just as a child doesn't always follow their parents' rules, as children of God, we don't always follow God's rules. But no matter what you do, even if you break all of the rules of your mom and dad, you're still, you're still their child. You're still their son. And this is the concept this is the gospel. It's a, you, know, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again. You cannot lose that salvation. You're God's child forever. And I also like to explain to people, say, well, look, is there anything that your child would, could do where you're just going to discipline them by putting them in the oven, turning on broil, shutting that, and just leaving them in there forever? Of course not. Right? When we discipline our, our, our children in different ways, you know, some people spank them or whatever. There's different methods we use. But you do it because you're trying to, to teach them the difference between right and wrong. And, and because you love them, that's why they have that discipline. So throwing them in the oven and, and turning on eye, that's not, gonna, you know, that's not showing your love for them. That's just, that's just executing them. But um, it's the same way that God, with his children, won't give us that punishment either. Now, for those of us that, you know, for those people that are not God's children, because they're not born again, yes, that is the recompense for their sin. That is the punishment that is meted out for their sin. But these are the types of things, you know, when you really break it down to someone, you, you, you start to, and if you have a conversation with people, you can start to realize they never really understood it that way. They never really quite got it. So on the surface, someone might say things like, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. And if you're not used to going out and really preaching the gospel to people, that might be enough for you and say, oh, okay, well, they're fine, they're safe because they say they believe in Jesus. But you have to really get to the heart of the matter, which is what we're all about. Now look at verse, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Look at verse 13 in Romans chapter 10 where we started because this gives us the, the, the mold and the outline of, of what happens for people to get saved. Verse number 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. True statement. Amen. But then look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So he's saying, well, wait a minute. Nobody's going to be calling on God if they don't even believe on him. If they don't believe on God, if they don't believe on Jesus, they're not going to call on him to save him. And then it goes further and he says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So he's saying it's impossible to believe on something unless you've actually heard about it. Right? That only makes sense. But then he says, okay, well, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And I want to, uh, you know, that, keep that phrase and that verse in mind because this is going to be extremely important. People have a tendency these days to associate the word preacher just completely with a pastor. Mm -hmm. And just say that, like, you know, I'm a preacher. And this is true because right now I'm preaching God's word. So I am a preacher. But it's not solely, a preacher is not solely the person standing behind the pulpit. Anybody who preaches God's word can be called a preacher because that's what you're doing. So look up for yourselves. There's, there's plenty of times where the Bible says to preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach. Everybody can be a preacher. Amen. Young, old, Whatever. If you're, if you're saved, you're born again, you can preach the gospel to other people and you can be a preacher. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't have this thought in your mind as we read these verses that, well, the preacher's just talking about the pastor. 
Because it's not. Because it's not just the pastor's job to go out and win souls. And we're, I'm going to prove that to you from Scripture. Look at verse 15 where we were. It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? This is why the local church is also so important. Because, look, people who don't go to church... They may for a little while start doing some soul and start, you know, start going out and trying to preach the gospel, but after a while, it's going to stop. And I know that just from my experience, for sure. And, and obviously, it says in the Bible, as, you know, which is, trumps my experience, but it says, how shall they preach? So people aren't going to go out preaching the gospel unless they're sent to do it. You know, if you're not in, that's, that's why none of these churches that don't have soul winning programs the members aren't going out and preaching the gospel because they're not being sent. But this church, what we're all about, we're about sending you out to preach the gospel. We need people to believe. We want people to call upon the name of the Lord. So in order for them to do that, they need to hear about it. In order to hear about it, they need someone to preach it to them. In order for someone to preach it, preach it to them, they need to be sent. This is a church that sends people out to preach the gospel. Look at what it says here how, uh, in verse 15. And how shall it preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I want to point out something else. And you may notice about our church, we don't do an altar call. We don't invite people to get saved at the end of service. And the reason for that is because I don't believe that the church service is, is geared towards just getting people saved. The church, per, church service is geared towards instructing, instructing and edifying the believers, people who are already saved. Church is, for, is literally a congregation of believers. Now, if someone comes in that's unsaved, hey, great, fine, come on in and have a seat. But we're not gearing the service. We're not gearing the, you know, the, anything about the service for the saved, what we ought to be doing, instead of doing the altar call where someone has to actually like stand up in front of everybody and come down and kind of like, you know, even have the courage to do that, what's way better than that is after service, approaching that person, welcoming, welcoming them, thanking them for coming to our church, and then have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them about salvation. And again, I could tell you countless times where I have sat in church and the message even happened to be a, a, like a gospel type of a message where it was going over an aspect, whether it be eternal security or some other aspect of salvation. And I go and I talk to someone who was a visitor for the first time. The whole thing just went over their head because they weren't saved. They didn't get it. They didn't understand the preaching from the pulpit, even though you, you know, very clearly explained what salvation is. It just the whole thing went over their head. But then after having a conversation with that person and being able to explain whatever they're... Because everyone's got different hang-ups, too. There's different aspects of the gospel that people don't understand, and everybody's unique. Everybody has their own you know, misunderstandings and understandings. So actually conversing with someone, you get to identify what their actual problem may be. I mean, some people, their problem is they don't even believe in hell. They don't believe it's real. They don't think it exists. Other people, it might be they think, well, I have to work my way there. You know, I mean, there's, there's all types of different things. So you won't know that unless you actually talk to that person and you can persuade them and show them the scriptures that they might need to see in order for them to, to really get a good understanding of what the gospel is and to make that decision to believe on it. So I, and that's why I encourage everybody, every time, welcome the people that come in, be very friendly. We ought to be a friendly church. We ought not to be stuck up snobs and then someone walks in and they, you know, they're not dressed quite right or you know, whatever, like you know, sticking up your nose at them. No, welcome everybody that comes into this church. But then also make it a point to when service is over, don't just go and talk to your friends. Talk to the people that come in and, and, you know, see if they're saved. Try to give them the gospel if they're not saved. Because we don't do the altar calls here. Because that way, here's another reason why we don't do the altar calls. I could do a whole sermon on this. But when you do the altar call, it relieves that, uh, that the urgency on every other member in the church to think, well, the pastor did the altar call, so if they wanted to get saved, then they should have just gotten up and gone down to the aisle and, you know, and gotten saved then. So nobody's even thinking about it anymore. And we don't, that's another reason why we don't do that. Because everybody ought to have it in their minds. When someone comes into this church, let's find out if they're saved. Because what more better opportunity is there 
for someone to get saved and actually coming to church. You know how hard it is to get people to come to church? We've been, we started this church a year and a half ago. And you can look around and see how many people are here this morning. And I go out multiple times a week, every single week, talking to people. It's not easy to get people to actually, I mean, it's hard enough preaching the gospel, trying to get them saved, but then trying to get people to come to church, it's not easy. It takes character. It takes, you know, it, it takes people who have a desire to want to come and to want to learn the things of God and, and to you know, change maybe their routine or their habits or whatever it may be to actually get off their rear end on a Sunday morning and show up to church. So when someone actually does that and they come in, hey, what more can you ask for? You know, most of the times you go out and people will be slamming the door and they don't want to talk to you. But here's someone who actually wants to come to church. Don't miss that opportunity. That is a great opportunity to give the gospel to somebody. But what I want to point out here in that verse that we just read in verse 15, he says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace excuse me, and bring glad tidings of good things. This is showing us that it's our feet. We need to go out to the lost. We don't try to suck them in and just change our music standards and change everything else to try to attract the lost into this building, into this place. We need to bring the gospel of peace to them and then get them in church. You know, the church is, a, I mentioned already, the church is a congregation of believers. We need to be going out. How beautiful are the feet? If, if the church was just for soul winning of just bringing people in here and getting them saved, what is your feet good for? I mean, you're sitting down in a chair, right? We need to bring the gospel. We need to bring the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things to the lost. We need to bring it to them. And we're going to go over a lot of verses that will tell us the same thing. And that's what it says in verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, it explains here, look, a person has to hear the word of God in order to be saved. Faith comes by hearing. And I firmly believe this, which is why we don't also have a, a, a tracting program. Now, we do have invitations. I'll show you what they look like. The invitation to our church, it gives the service times, a little map, you know, a, a, a Bible verse on here, and um, just real brief information about the church. And on the back, it says the Bible way to heaven. Now, I, it's not that I think there's anything wrong with this. We have it on our, you know, gospel tracks or whatever. I don't think that that in itself is a problem. But what I don't ever want this to be is a substitute for preaching the gospel. Okay, so if you have tracks and you want to use that and you want to leave that with people, fine. No problem with that. I have zero problems with that. But don't let that be your substitute for you preaching the gospel because the Bible says here, faith comes by hearing. It's not by reading. I mean, if, it was, if someone were able to just read the Bible and get saved, like why would, we would just, I mean, we would spend all of our time and efforts just getting New Testaments or Bibles just out to everybody here so that they could read it and get saved. No, they need to understand the gospel because someone needs they need to hear it by a preacher, as we already saw in Romans 10. They need to be, someone needs to be sent out to preach the gospel so that they could hear God's word. And by the way, it's hearing by the word of God, not just a summary or synopsis and just say, well, Jesus died for your sins, and all you have to do is believe on him. And then they hear that and get saved. No, you need to be using God's word. Because God's word is the truth. God's word is that seed that you're sowing in their heart. It's not your own words. People don't get saved by your words. People get saved by God's word. God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. God's word is what's going to pierce through to their heart and their soul and divide asunder soul and spirit. God's word will pierce through to, to bring the truth in there. That's what you're sowing into their heart. Now, we help explain that God's word to them, but ultimately it's God's word that needs to take root in their heart in order for that new creature to, to be born again. Okay, that's what we need. And so, so we always, 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 always bring our Bibles with us and show people God's Word. At the very least, if you have your Bible with you, have it memorized. So you could quote the verses to them. Now, it's not all just verses. We explain it as well. Acts, turn if you would to Acts chapter 8, because this is a prime example of how we go soul winning. It's found in the book of Acts chapter number 8. Just one book back. If you're in Romans, just flip back to Acts. Acts chapter 8. We're going to see the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. 
We're going to start reading in verse number 26. The Bible reads, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had, charge, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. So, you know, there's this man, this, this eunuch. He's from Ethiopia. He had traveled all the way to Jerusalem to worship. So here's a church-going man, right? Here's someone who's, who's seeking God, and you know, he's, he's, he's trying to figure out what the truth is or whatever. He goes to church, and he's, he's on his way back. He's, he's returning back to Ethiopia, and he's in his chariot, you know, and he's reading the Bible. He's reading the Scripture. He's reading Isaiah. And Philip is prompted by the, the Holy Spirit to go. He's like, go near, join yourself under this chariot. He's like, go up, go up to this guy. Verse 30, and Philip ran thither to meet to, to him. He ran to him. Look, we, he's not dragging his feet going, oh, I guess I'll have to talk to this guy. You know, he ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? So he goes up to the chair and he hears the guy reading the Bible. He's reading out loud. And he's saying, do you really understand what you're reading there? And look at what he said. Look at the answer in verse 31. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Now look, this is what the lost is like. The, the, the Bible, God's word, is spiritually discerned. This is a book that we need the Holy Ghost to help teach us to understand what it means. And before you're saved, it's like you have blinders on to the truth. You can't quite get it. You need someone to explain it to you. You need someone to help you to understand it so that you can receive it then and get saved. This guy even knew that. He said, look, I, I don't quite understand. Someone needs to help me with this. I, I don't understand what this means. And I could tell you from my own experience, you know, I didn't get saved until I was 20 years old, trying to read the Bible, and just none of it made any sense to me at all. I'd just be reading it, like, man, this is confusing. I don't understand what this book's talking about. And there's a few things you could kind of pick up just in general because you know the English language. But overall, I mean, you really do not get the meaning of the Bible when you read it when you're not saved. So this guy, he, he gets that. He sees this. He's saying, I, I don't quite know what this is talking about. So verse 32, it says the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb, dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? He said, you know, is, he, is, he, is this he referring to, is Isaiah referring to himself or is he referring to someone else? Is he prophesying? He's like, what is this talking about? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, he's using this very same scripture he has, and preach unto him Jesus. So he's giving him now the meaning of this verse. And what a great verse for him to be reading. Of course, I'm sure it's no accident he was on this portion of Scripture, this prophecy of Jesus Christ himself. And he's showing him, wait, wait, you know, this, this is actually talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about our Savior. This is talking about the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And he preaches Jesus unto him. Look at the word, preached. Mm -hmm. He preached unto him Jesus. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, Here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? They say, well, look, there's water right there. Can I, why can't I be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He didn't know anything about Jesus. He didn't understand the Bible. Philip preaches Jesus to him, and then he's like, Whoa, well, I'll get baptized. He said, Okay, well, wait. The only way I'm going to baptize you is if you believe on Christ, if you're saved. But he answers, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This happened as a result of Philip opening up his mouth and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ unto him using God's word. This is a perfect example of soul winning in the Bible. Let's just finish off the story. Verse 38 it says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, and both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So Philip 
Great soul winner. He's going around and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to all these different cities and stuff. This is what we need more Phillips today. We need more people in our churches to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3, near the end of your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3. <coughs> If you go backwards, you got the book of Revelation and Jude and then 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John. And you have 2nd Peter. We're in 2nd Peter chapter number 3. Look at verse number 9. A very, very popular verse. It's preached on pretty, pretty often. The Bible says in verse 9, 2nd Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look, God doesn't want, the word willing means he doesn't want it. God does not want anybody to perish. God does not want people to die and go to hell. It's not God's desire. Okay? He is not, he's not up in heaven just wishing for people that, man, I just hope that guy doesn't receive Christ. He dies and goes to hell. That is not God's heart at all. God loves us. He wants everybody to get saved. Now, ask yourself this. If God doesn't want anyone to perish, and God's all-powerful, God could do whatever He wants, right? Then why are there still few that are saved? And see, we're, we're church, we don't believe in the doctrine of Calvinism that, that teaches that God picks and chooses, you know, this person's going to heaven because it's my will that they're, they're going to heaven. This person's not going to heaven. They're going to go to hell forever because I'm just going to harden their heart. I'm going to make sure that they don't go to, they get saved. And this person doesn't, this person. We don't believe in that. That is a completely different God. Yeah. That is a twisted, bizarre, messed up God that's just going to just damn people to hell before they even ever have a chance to get saved. Look, we believe, like this verse says, he's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. Okay? Yet there's still few that are saved. Matt, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Matthew 7, uh, 7 proves that there are few that are saved. When, the Bible, when Jesus Christ said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, straight meaning narrow, and narrow is the way, he repeats himself, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There are few people that get saved. Unfortunately, it's few. But the reason why it's narrow because it's only through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But if God doesn't want anyone to perish, then why are they perishing? Why are they going to hell? The reason why is because He's given us the job of going out and preaching the gospel. That's one of the reasons. And if people aren't doing it, then people aren't going to be getting saved. It's bottom line. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to start reading in verse number 17. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So if you're born again today, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Look at this. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So what this verse is saying, God, if you're born again, you're a new creature, old things are passed away, all things have become new. You needed to become reconciled with God because we have sin. We have a problem with God when we sin. Before you get saved, that's a big problem. That's a huge problem because those sins carry the sentence of hell. We need to reconcile that with God. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. So when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because He paid for all of those sins, that is the reconciliation that, that you have received. And now all of a sudden, hey, now you're in the family. Now you're my son. Now you're my daughter. Now you're my child. Because you have put your faith in Christ and He paid for all of your sins. We're good now. Your sins are forgiven. But then he gives us, he's given unto us that ministry. Ministry is just, you know, ministering unto others. Of bringing that message, that reconciliation to others. 
We have that ministry of reconciliation. It's our jobs to help other people to get reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. He's given us that job. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Jesus Christ is no longer walking around on this earth. He was on this earth for about 33 years. That's it. That's when you can say God himself, in the form of Jesus Christ, was actually able to bring souls to him. Right? Because he was preaching the gospel to the lost. He was able to, to literally get people saved while he was on this earth by his own words preaching the gospel unto them. But he's no longer on this earth doing that. We can't just assume that if God wants someone to get saved, then somehow, miraculously, they're just going to get saved. Look, if he doesn't use us to do it, that's not, it's, just, it's a false belief because God has given us that job. We are ambassadors for Christ. So he says, as though God did beseech you by us. That's our job. We are Christ's ambassador. Since he's no longer here on this earth, he's saying, okay, we are his ambassador. We are in his place. We are representing Jesus Christ. That's what ambassadors, even the United States has ambassadors in foreign countries, right? And they are supposed to be um, presenting the, the, the goals and in the, the mission of the United States and kind of being a spokesperson for the United States government. That's what an ambassador does. Well, in, for Jesus Christ, we are to be ambassadors for him. We are to be his spokesperson. We are to be the ones that bring that message and gospel of Jesus Christ because he's no longer on this earth doing it. It's our job. He's given us that job. We are his ambassadors, and we need to treat that job very seriously. If God considers you to be an ambassador, do you think he wants you sleeping on the job and not doing the job? Of course not. That's silly. He wants us to go out and do this job. Turn, if you would, to you're in 2 Corinthians. Just flip back one book to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll read from you from 1 Thessalonians 2. This was our previous Bible memory passage. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 said, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God would try their hearts. That verse is saying, you know, God allowed us to have this great trust. He put this trust in us to preach the gospel. That's the trust he's given to us, and we were allowed of God. What a great honor that is, that he has given us that job. Such an important job. The, the, the job that will determine the fate of many has been given unto us. You're in 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye, ye is the plural form of you, you all believed. Through these ministers. They all believed through Paul and through Apollos. Not just from reading the scripture, but by these ministers. Even as the Lord gave to every man. Every man has a minister that God has appointed for them to go out and preach the gospel to them. So that they can believe. I believe that God has a job and he has a plan for every single person on this planet. And he wants them all to do his will. Now we don't always do his will. We live in a fallen world, in a sinful world, but if we were doing everything according to God's plan for us, we would be, I mean, everybody would be hearing the gospel. Now, of course, he's given us free will to either receive or reject that, but God has given us ministers through whom we believe. Ministers that bring us that word. We need to be those ministers. Mark 16, 15, really famous, right? The Great Commission. Everybody's probably heard of the Great Commission before. Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye, again, go. He didn't say, stay where you're at and let people come to you and let people see the great life that you live and ask you about how wonderful your life is and why is it so wonderful. He doesn't say, sit around and wait for that. He says, go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is our job and our mission, to go out and preach the gospel. Everybody. Don't just ignore some people. Don't say, oh, that person's Jehovah's Witness, so I don't want to talk to them. No, preach them the gospel. It's not up to you to determine who you're going to preach the gospel to. Just, just preach it unto the world. Let them decide. They can either receive it or reject it. 
But Jesus said when his, you know, his last great message, his great commission, before he ascended up in heaven was preach the gospel to every creature. This is what I want you to do. Go into all the world. Go out and do it. He was sending them, his disciples, to go out and do this. Just like our church is sending you, hey, go out into Prescott Valley. Go out into the neighborhoods. Go out and preach the gospel. Now, we have a door-to-door -door ministry. We go out knocking on doors, but that's not the only way to go soul winning. Obviously, that's the way that we do it. But hey, you see someone walking around, stop them, approach them, have a conversation. You're at the gas station pumping gas. You see someone, approach them, have a conversation. At the grocery store, you have someone come over for business, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. There's so many, you know, we have so many interactions with people on a, on a regular basis. We need to have that. See, most of the time, we're not even thinking about that, but you ought to be. Oftentimes, people aren't even thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're doing your business, you're doing your thing, you're pumping your gas, you're on your way somewhere, you know, you're, you're, you're focused on whatever it is that you're doing. What I want to do is help to instill in you this desire and this, this, get your spirit worked up to constantly be thinking about the lost, to constantly be thinking, hey, here's a great opportunity to give the gospel. This ought to be in the forefront of our minds at all times. Are you in 1 Corinthians 3 still? Is that where I had you, the last place I had you turn? Turn, if you would, to chapter number 9. Chapter number 9. <clears throat> and look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe, woe is extreme sadness, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. God has committed this job unto us. This is our responsibility. He's saying, look, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. This is my job. I need to do this. And look, if you do it willingly, God has a great reward for you. God will heap. Yo, you want to know how to earn rewards in heaven? Win souls to Christ. That is how you are going to earn your rewards in heaven. Um, I saw my notes, but even in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to turn it real quick. Bob reads in, in verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians 2, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. He's talking about people who got saved, people who believe you're our crown and rejoicing. You, you know, the, the more souls that you win to Christ, that you convert to Christ, that you have them get right with God. God will give you rewards based on that work. Because it's work. It's not easy. And that's another reason why so many people aren't out doing it because it's work. It's, it's hard work going out and talking to people. Look, I, I, you know, I've never worked a job. I've worked at all kinds of different jobs. I have never been more exhausted and drained physically than a full day out of giving the gospel, preaching the gospel to people. And anyone who's gone and done it for a full day knows what that feeling is like. If you know what it's like to work a hard day and you come home tired and you're just like, oh man, I'm going to sleep good tonight. Because I put in a hard day's work, even hard back breaking labor, go out and preach the gospel all day. Mm -hmm. You'd think, well, it's not, I mean, you're just talking. It's not a big deal, right? It shouldn't be that hard. Go out and do it all day. You'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. And look, it's a great feeling, too. And, and, you know, I love getting things accomplished, I love working hard. You get a job done, man, you may be super tired and drained, but what a great sense of accomplishment when you get something done. That feeling is so much greater when you spend an entire day out soul winning. And you go doing the Lord's work, and people hear, and they receive the gospel, and they get saved. They put their faith on Christ. They call upon the name of the Lord. Hey, it doesn't matter how tired you are. That will bring you some joy. That will make you happy. But this is our job. Uh, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians 4. You're in 1 Corinthians 9. Let's go a few pages forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're almost done. I have one more point after this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
Verse number one, the Bible reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the, gods, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light, to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, look, if our gospel is hid, if you, if you don't, if you hide the gospel message, I mean, look, if you're saved today, you know the gospel, or else how did you get saved? Right? You have to know the gospel because that's what got you saved. You know what it is. And that's why I'm saying, you know, it doesn't matter where you are at in your spiritual life. You can still be a babe in Christ. But if you're saved, you know how you got saved. You may not be adept at, at really going through the, the Bible and, and knowing where everything is. But look, in order to get someone else saved, you don't have to know where everything is in the Bible. You don't. You know that you're saved. You could, look, you could take this invitation out and use these verses that we have on here. It's enough. To help someone understand it. I mean, and if you don't like these verses, use some other ones. Get a few verses. Even John 3.16, if you're using God's Word, can be enough. Now look, the more you can use and the more you learn, you know, the better you're going to be, the more success you're going to have because you know, you're, able, you're able to answer a lot more and help people to get, to get a better grasp and a better understanding. But even if you don't know that much, look at the, I love the example of the woman at the well. She didn't know that much. She got saved when Jesus Christ said, look, I, you know, and she said, well, we know that when Messiah cometh, he'll show us all things. He says, I that speak unto thee, unto thee am he. You're saying, look, I am the Messiah. She believed on Christ. What did she do? The very first thing is she left her pail there. She went into town and she started pointing people to Christ. She said, isn't this, look, look, this is the Christ. Isn't this him? And she pointed people in the direction. The very first thing she did, she'd go soul winning. Simon Peter with Andrew, his brother. You know, Andrew believes on him. And he's saying, look, we found the Christ. Isn't this Christ? And he, brought, and he brought Simon Peter to Jesus. It doesn't matter where you're at in your spiritual walk. You don't have to be in church for 10 years or, or whatever to go out and, and actually preach the gospel to people. No matter where you're at in your spiritual life, you can do it. And God wants you to do it. And I'll tell you what, it'll help you to grow too. It'll help you understand more about the, about the Bible. You'll want to do things better. you want to do things more. Nobody that starts off is just, just right out of the door, but just great at giving the gospel to somebody. You're going to fumble around. You're going to stumble. You know, you're going you're to get, you know, your brain's going to go dead. You're not going to know what to say. You know, you might get a little bit confused. It's fine. You might be nervous. I remember, look, <laughs> just a little bit about me personally. I'm a computer programmer. I am, I have always been, and it's changed recently, way more introverted. Not someone, you know, not someone who always had a huge group of friends, small group of friends, right? Fear and dread came over me in high school just knowing that I had to take a speech class because you can't graduate without a speech class. This is, this is me, okay? This is me who you're supposed to just pre, you're supposed to have a speech class off of notes. I had the whole thing written down on like real tiny on my index cards because I could not trust myself to get in front of people and be able to speak because I was so terrified of it. Okay, that's who I was. I got into a good church. Soul winnings emphasized. I can see from the scripture a lot of these same verses and other verses that tell us, look, this is our job. This is what we need to do. I knew in my head I needed to do this. It doesn't take much convincing logically to see it and to, to read it in scripture and say, yeah, this is important. This is what we need to be doing. 
but it takes that extra effort to actually follow through and do it. But I saw it, I knew it was right, and even though I was scared to death of it, I said, well, I want to do what's right. That's, I mean, God's not going to tell you to do something that you can't do. God's not going to tell you, you know, say this is your job, but, but put you in charge of something that you're just incapable of doing it. Everybody is capable of doing it. This isn't one of the spiritual gifts. Okay, look up the chapters that talk about spiritual gifts. I preached on this about a month ago. It talks about healing and working of miracles and, and all these other things. Winning souls of Christ is not a spiritual gift. It's not something that only some people have. This is a job that's given unto all of us. If I can go out and do it. Now look, the first time I open up my mouth, and, and, and here's, this is what's great about the way, what I like about the way that we're doing things and the way that I learned how to do things. We send people out in pairs. Similar like, like Jesus Christ, he sent his disciples out two and two, right? And we have one person that preaches and one person's a silent partner. So people who are new to presenting the gospel to someone say, I wouldn't really know where to start can be the silent partner. Go with someone who has done it before, who has the experience. Come with us and just listen. And you know, the silent partner's got a lot to do with the job too because the silent partner can be praying and there's, and there's all kinds of things. And I go over some of that stuff in, our, in, in the soul winning workshops that we have. But that's how you're going to learn. You're going to learn through the experience and say, okay, yeah, I could do this. And it took me like three months before I worked up the courage to even say, I think I might be able to do this. And the first time I did it, thankfully it was, it was to a younger boy, maybe about 13 or 14 years old. Okay? So not too intimidating, right? I mean, it's not like, like an older man who's going to be looking at me as a young kid just saying, you know, what, what, what are you going to teach me? So I wasn't, I, I, I shouldn't have been too intimidated by him, but I was, I was still, you know, real nervous. I was giving the gospel. I was trying to flip through my Bible and find, oh, yeah, and it's in here somewhere, you know, I know. I even got to a point where I was flipping, I dropped my Bible, and my invitations went all over the place, and I'm still trying to have this conversation with him. You could look at me and be like, man, that guy's making a fool out of himself. But I'll tell you what, that kid got saved. Good. It wasn't my power. With stammering lips and another tongue, the Bible says, God's word will be preached, and he could use your stammering lips and your inability. And actually, God is glorified so much the more through people who don't have the skills. He can use you. He can use you whoever you are. I've seen him use a, a mentally handicapped person, someone with Down syndrome. That, that was, it was really difficult for her to give the gospel because of her disability. But she, she knew some of the verses and, and you know, she was able to give it. She was able to win people to Christ. I believe everybody can do this. And we should do it. Not just can, we should. You may have to get over some hurdles of, of fear, of anxiety, of, of you know, whatever might be holding you back. But it's important. I mean, people's souls are at stake. You know, if, if we don't do it, then who is? Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? You can't rely on other people. It's not being done. You know, churches talk about sending missionaries out to all these different countries, and that's great, and I'm for missionaries preaching the gospel, but we have a mission field right here in the United States. There's doors. There are people that have not even heard about Jesus Christ. I've talked to, to, to younger, you know, children, or, or you know, I mean, older children, you know, young adults, and it, blew, it blows my mind every time I run across one. They don't know anything about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean nothing. And I'll even ask, like, well, wait, do you, I mean, do you know what, like, like, why we celebrate Christmas? No. To them, Christmas is Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what Easter's about? No. To them, <laughs> Easter's about a bunny and some eggs. And literally, it's, it's sad. It saddens my heart. Because, like, do you know anything about, do you know that he died on a cross? No. I think I've seen some cross, you know, Nothing. In America, in the United States of America. Blows my mind every time. And, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. But the younger generation, 
it's, I mean, it's, it's going by the wayside, folks. We need more workers. We need more laborers. That's why Jesus said, pray the you know, Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers out. Fields are white unto harvest. There's plenty of people that are just waiting to get saved. We need to go out and do the work. I'm going to close on this verse, Matthew chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you'd like. Matthew 4. When Jesus was rounding up his disciples, he was, he was gathering his 12, the, the, you know, his, the people he chose to be his disciples. Matthew 4, 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. So these fishermen, Andrew and Peter. They were out doing their job. They were working. They were fishermen. Verse 19 says, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, one of the things that I take away from this verse, if you claim that you are following Christ, a lot of people make that claim. I am following Christ to the best of my ability. If you're following Christ, are you a fisher of men? Because Jesus Christ said, follow me. If you do this, if you follow me, I will make you <laughs> fishers of men. In order to truly be following Christ. Now you can get a lot of sin out of your life. And, and, and in a sense, you're, you know, you're following Christ in that way. But if you're truly going to be following him, you're going to be doing the things that he did. What did he do? He preached the gospel to the lost. He, he went out into, into, into the lost in Israel, and he preached unto them the gospel of salvation. And he said, if you're going to be following Jesus, he's going to, because that's what he wants you to do. This is God's will for your life. He wants you to win the lost. More than anything, that's what he wants you to do, is to win the lost. Getting the sin out of our life is going to help you to be better at that job. Reading your Bible more is going to help you be better at your job. Going to church is going to help you be better at that job. All these different things that we do is just going to make you a better soul winner because that is ultimately the job, and that's given to everybody. You know, being a pastor, there's qualifications on that. Doing other things, being a, being a deacon, there's, there's different qualifications for that. The Bible lays out, look, qualifications for preaching the gospel, are you saved? It's our job. This is what this church is all about. I hope you, you know, if nothing else, you know, walk away with that. You know, there may be differences, doctor, fine. And if it's, if it's a big enough issue for you to leave, fine. But, um, this is what we need to be doing more than anything. And this church is going to be sending people out to do that work, which is why we offer the, the soul winners lunch. You know, I'll do, I will do as much as I possibly can to help you to go out and preach the gospel. I have a, a relatively flexible schedule. If the days that we have listed in the bulletin don't work out for you, I will do my best to either go out with you personally or have somebody else go out with you that can accommodate a time that will work around your schedule. I oftentimes will go out on Saturdays. There are different times that we can do this. So if you're interested in this and these times don't work out, let me know. Approach me. I would love to, to, to work out a time for you. And um, again, I mean, if you've never done this before, you could be a silent partner. You know, this is the most important thing. So hopefully, you know, God will stir up your spirit to, to realize this. And um, if you're not doing this, that you'll start doing this uh, today. We've got a time today, 2 o'clock, we'll have lunch, and we'll go out and we'll knock on some doors. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful gift that you've given to us, our gift of salvation, dear Lord. What a wonderful gift. You don't require the work out of us, dear God. You don't require the church attendance for us to be saved and go to heaven because you want us to be saved so badly you give us a free gift. God, help us not to hide that gift under a bushel. Help us not to hide that gift away and to keep it just to ourselves and not to share that gift with others and to show other people, hey, you can have this gift too. God, please work in our hearts to want to have a love for the, for the lost out there to show them how easy it is to be saved. God, help us to have that desire and love for other people that we can truly love others as you have loved us. God, stir us up. I pray that you would please use Word of Truth Baptist Church, even if no one else is doing it, dear God, to reach the people in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In whose blessed name we pray, amen.